I'd like to introduce our guest today. John Cobb is an American theologian, philosopher, and environmentalist. He is often regarded as the preeminent scholar in the field of process philosophy and process theology, the school of thought associated with the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. Um, Cobb is the author of more than 50 books, and in 2014, he was elected to the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Scientists, Sciences. Welcome to the podcast, John. Oh, very happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. So I usually start the podcast off by asking the guest a little bit about their upbringing in the context of religion and spirituality. And I've listened to several of your conversations, and I've, I've really enjoyed hearing about your life. Um, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about some of your early struggles with your faith and um, what what it was and what is uh, what it is about process theology that um, allowed you to preserve your inherited Christianity in an authentic way to you. Well, thank you. Uh, I. I suppose I should say first that I had uh, uh, an upbringing in a family that was uh, Methodist and uh, was pious, devout. Uh, Methodists are fortunate in that they're not stuck with some of the doctrines that Calvinists and Lutherans are. Mm -hmm. Wesley was so eager that we not be believe in predestination that he never used the word almighty with respect to God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a little ditty we used to sing. God has no, hand, no hands but our hands to do his work today. Mm -hmm. Well, the emphasis is clearly not on God doing everything, but rather that we had big responsibilities. Right. Uh, so I didn't have the uh, radical puzzles about why doesn't God do this and that and so forth that a lot of other people did. But my first, um, which was a um, awakening to the fact that there was a wider world of thought that I had missed completely was when I was in the army in World War II. So it's not the place you used to think of as where you go in order to get educated. <laughs> yeah. But because um, I had, I mean, my experience in, in the South and uh, in Japan with Methodist missionaries and so forth, was very different from most of the people I was in a unit with in, in the army, which was a unit preparing us to translate Japanese documents and then to translate them, of course, after, mm -hmm. after our studies. And almost all the people in my unit were from New York City. They, when they saw war coming, the people of the more intellectual interests thought they'd rather spend it behind the desk translating Japanese <laughs> than in a unit in a trench somewhere. So that, I, I just, that was the beginning of intellectual reflection. I mean, I was a thoughtful child, but that's very different. I, it was the discovery that there was a whole history of of thinkers who I had, if I'd heard their names, it was in passing. Right. Yeah. So that was step number one. And um, it happened that, that these people were, none of them were Protestant, uh, Jews and Catholics, all of them, I think. 
Mm -hmm. And I have not encountered any Jews or virtually no Catholics before. So that was a work. So I, I definitely wanted to um, educate myself. And of course, one of the things I learned, it, it didn't, I mean, it didn't shake my faith in any fundamental way, but that believing in God had made one something of an oddity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that most people didn't. Well, that didn't tell me I shouldn't, but nevertheless, it made me think this was the topic I needed to wrestle with. And I was told that Chicago was a good place to go. Most of the universities had, by that time, succumbed to the academic disciplines. And academic disciplines are not designed for thinking. They're designed for research. Hmm. And Chicago was the, sort of the last holdout among the major universities for to think of the university as an intellectual center. So that, I, I didn't know much about that, but it, when the, my friends said that'd be a good place for you to go, I applied and it was also possible for me to go directly into a graduate program, even though I hadn't even finished. Well, I, I had enough credits to be through a junior, junior college by then. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, that was attractive to me. So I spent a year in a program on the analysis of ideas and the study of method. And I was, my job, I, I had said, well, the task I had studied before myself is to study all the reasons for not believing in God. Hmm. And of course, that would mean I'd, I'd also need to study some reasons for believing in God. <laughs> But, yeah. but the point was, I believe, and I want to find out why people didn't think that was the sensible thing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, during that year, I encountered process thought in the person of Charles Hartzell. And I found what he said just very convincing. But at the same time, I encountered a world in which everything was explained without reference to God. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't hear, I mean, I, I couldn't find many arguments, especially. I just found that uh, leaving God out didn't seem to leave anything else out. So God's when I discovered that the modern world had a way of looking at things that left God out, and uh, to the satisfaction of a great many people in the modern world, including most of the professors at a university like Chicago, it uh, it wasn't. I mean, that was that's not the kind of argument I thought I was looking for. Right. But uh, it. I, the way I describe it is my prayers bounce back from the ceiling. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I, I don't think I need to do this for three years. <laughs> I think a, a year is enough and I better go to the divinity school and find out how people are thinking there. Yeah. So that was my, my quite limited death of God experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it, it was a it was quite painful. Yeah. And uh, but it prepared me for the Federated Theological Faculty. Mm -hmm. And when the when I enrolled in the Divinity School, the first person I encountered was the Dean, Bernard Luma, who uh, told us our job was to figure out what we believed and be able to, to defend it. Hmm. That's what you, I think you understand what I mean by an intellectual atmosphere. Right, right. That's quite different from most divinity schools and 
and now especially from, from most anything that goes on in universities. Yeah. So that is that uh yeah that's that's good that's good i'm curious um when you found process philosophy process theology did you did you talk to your parents about that how'd they feel about that um i i did i did not discuss my uh my faith issues at that time with my parents. It's not that I wasn't in, in good relationship with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I had been a, you know, just sitting down together, yeah. but writing a letter to explain these things and so forth, they were, they were in Japan and I was in Chicago. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious also, about uh, you know how do you see what's the role of jesus in process theology to you mm -hmm. well of course process theology it, it could mean uh a catholic process theology or it could mm -hmm. mean an islamic process theology right or even a Hindu process theology. So, yeah. so if the role of Jesus is in the Christian theology. Sure, sure. Although interestingly enough, also in a, a Muslim one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had not fully taken that in until I, a Muslim woman started going to church with me. She, she didn't like the way, she, as a woman, she was treated in the mosque. And she said she had always been a Muslim who loved Jesus. Mm. And that's very orthodox mm -hmm. for Muslims. I've told people the reason I couldn't be a Muslim is I would have to believe in the virgin birth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I, I'm, I've already, I, I have to warn you that my memory mm -hmm is fading mm -hmm. so i have forgotten the question that i'm supposed to be asked <laughs> that's okay yeah well i you made some good points there and so I, i'm i guess i'm just curious about how you oh, well, envision not, oh, the role of jesus in of christian jesus. process theology sure, sure well i uh, there are, when i say jesus i am referring to a, a Jew who lived in Israel. I never thought about being anything besides a Jew. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have, have never been too attached to the creeds that were developed 300 years later. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I became, I mean, of course, I knew quite a bit about Jesus' teaching because we talked about it yeah. quite a lot. But I think that I became more aware of how remarkable his teaching is. And I, I now like to say, I don't know whether I'm a Christian or not. I mean, I am by, by my own definition, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. But for people who say, oh, a Christian is one who believes in the Trinity, well, oh, maybe I can figure out some way of believing in right. the Trinity, but it's completely artificial for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I consider myself a disciple of Jesus. Okay. And I think, uh, the, I think really the greatest disciple of Jesus in, in the last hundred years has been a Hindu, Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. he, Jesus' mission was to save his people from continuing to battle against the Roman armies, which he thought completely wasteful and destructive, and find another way, not of gaining total independence, but of transforming the relationship to Rome. Yeah. And, yeah. and very few Christians, even today, have taken that seriously. Yeah, that's true. Martin Luther King did. Yep. 
but he, he really was inspired by Gandhi. Yep. Gandhi would, but Gandhi got it from Jesus very explicitly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to, to me, being a disciple of Jesus, in my case, I'm happy going to church. I'm comfortable in Methodist churches that I attend. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I really think that today the world really needs to pay attention to Jesus. One of the things Jesus taught is you can't serve both money and God. Mm. And we are serving money and we are not serving God. Yeah. If you don't want to use the word God, I, I'm very comfortable with the word God, but I do understand it means something quite different to other people. Sure. What it means to us in the process. Uh, mm -hmm. Family, Whitehead talks about world loyalty. It's a, a, a devotion to the entirety of things. Yeah. Not yeah. for one part and against other parts. But yeah. It, it, in traditional language, it's all the creation of God. God sees it all to be good. So if we declare some of what God declared good to be bad, well, that's not a very faithful way. <laughs> Of, of dealing with it it's certainly not Jesus way yeah yeah I I love I love your emphasis on that I, I love that your you know your 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 books and your action in the world for the last several decades have been about social engagement you know not about removing oneself from the world but confronting the issues in the world and trying to transform the world. Um, and I know you've done a lot of interfaith dialogue with Buddhists, which I find really interesting. And, and I, um, I'm very influenced by Buddhism, and I've studied it for several years now. And um, I guess my question about that is, I've heard you kind of reference how maybe one... Um, one thing that that's lacking in your perspective in Buddhism is the tendency for it to sometimes be ahistorical. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess, what do you think that Buddhists can learn from Christians and what can Christians learn from Buddhists? Well, I'll, I'll start with the former. Uh, philosophically, Whitehead's position, but I, do, I mean, of course, he, he had positions on many subjects. Yes. But the fundamental vision was that every, the world is made up of events, and every event is an instance of everything becoming one. Mm -hmm. In other words, everything is made up of its relations to, to everything that has been. Yep. And I, I think that that's, you, you can find almost exactly the same thing in Buddhism. Absolutely. So Gautama is, uh, in so far as Buddhists follow Gautama, mm -hmm. uh, for them to accept Whitehead is a very natural thing. Yeah. Now, of course, Buddhists, like everybody else, have done a lot of other stuff sure. <laughs> since the time of, of Gautama, <laughs> and they yeah. have divided up among different groups and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the man I had the most extended work with, and uh, Masa Abe, was a Zen Buddhist who was very emphatic, emphatically an atheist. Mm. And uh, I, I don't, uh, by far, there in Japan and in China, there are more, more people in Pure Land Buddhism than there are in Zen. Mm -hmm. And even Zen Buddhists don't have, to, I mean, <laughs> they can find ways of using the word God positively if they really want to. But, yeah. but uh, 
I had a, a, also a very good friend who was the leading Pure Land Buddhist theologian for Western Japan. And uh, he and I and Abe, sometimes the three of us would have discussions. And he and I would agree on almost everything. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so philosophically, I think if people could learn from Buddha, they don't have, to, it's much easier for them to learn from Whitehead also. Yeah. And so I, I, I don't mean that you have to get it from, from Buddha in order sure. to get it from Whitehead, but obviously um, the, the, the difference between, between the Whiteheadian version and many Buddhist versions, and I hope you understand, not all. Sure. I can find allies in, is that the, the tendency of negating substance is to make it somehow less important. You, you, you are liberated from anxieties about all the petty things that are going on, but also all the big things that are going on also. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, the Whiteheadian version doesn't do that. Uh, what happens in every event is important. Yeah. In yeah. every moment. And uh, of course, you you decenter it. it it's no longer that it's important to you it's just mm -hmm. important in itself right and uh, but but you are you are called to do what, what you can about whatever issues are appropriate for you to engage in nobody can can, can deal with anything and I was very pleased that um, a development within Buddhism that was called say, socially engaged Buddhism. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm not saying Buddhists have to, have to be different from process folks sure. in that way, but just historically, that was the objection that the Confucianists had to Buddhists. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. for Confucianists, making the community you are living in into a healthy and happy one is extremely important. And Buddhists yep. were tending to withdraw from, from that. And so they, they quarreled on, on that same subject. Yep. And uh, my thinking is much more like Buddha than like Confucius, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it, it has something of the Confucian about it also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that you know that actually bridges nicely to what I was going to ask you next. Um, you know, I think one of the just as you were just saying, you know, one of your highest values is community, and I. I share that as one of my highest values as well. And um, I'm wondering, are you hopeful? Are you hopeful about um, the presence of, of healthy and, and, you know, healthy communities in, in the United States uh, in, in the coming years, in the coming decades? Do you, do you, do you feel hopeful or, or more, hopeless about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I say, if you just look at the world and don't believe there is any spiritual power that introduces novelty and creativity into it, if you think of it as modern science tends to think of it, mm -hmm. where there's an, where there are no, I mean, you put, if you have purposes, you can have them, but purpose is never used in the explanation of anything, just as God is not used in the explanation of anything. Purpose is not. I, I, if, you, if that's the world, I have no hope at all. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. But because I don't think that exhausts the world. I think all of us have the experience of creative novelty. Me too. We don't know the future. If you just project the present into the future, it's pretty desperate. Yeah. But to, to think about uh, alternatives to the practices that now dominate is, is to think about, is to, I mean, I think that's what hope as a virtue, mm -hmm. not, not hope as a practical judgment that there are, that there's 51% chance that we will avoid mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. evil. But uh, hope as faith, hope, and love. Um, mm -hmm. I, the faith is, is better translated faithfulness. As right. Faithfulness, hopefulness, and love. Oh, mm -hmm. not, they, they're not options. They're, they're, they're what we're all called to engage in. And so we must be hopeful. Yes. Yes, but I'm not. I'm not optimistic. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, related to that topic, I, I see you have a, a poster banner for Living Earth Movement. Yes, yes. Which, uh, you know, as far as I understand, that's that's something that you started this year. Is that right? Yes, um, I, I, I guess we did, we've gotten a little bit on it last year, toward mm -hmm. the end of last year. But Can yeah. you say, you know, kind of like, how is it expressing itself right now? You know, what's your sure. vision for the Living Earth Movement? Well, I'll, I will first say that uh, it, it's kind of crazy, but I think it's a sign that I am, that I do have hope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That I... I've been in, I'm involved in a lot of organizations. Yeah, I know. I was already on six boards. Uh, so to create another organization seems <laughs> utterly absurd. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I realized I, I have, uh, I've had special opportunities in China. You don't really expect a Protestant theologian to find the Chinese more receptive than the Americans, but they, yeah. certainly, they certainly are. Uh, and um, I have been distressed and continue to be distressed that since 9-11, the neocons took over our foreign policy. And our foreign policy is very clear. It's to make the US the the one power in the world mm -hmm. so that if one wants to be independent of the U.S., one is an enemy of the U.S. Yeah. And uh, what we need is if we're going to make the right changes, we need the great powers of the world to work together. Yep. To, to, to deal with problems that are global problems. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain irony that Biden actually appealed to Xi to work together with him on environmental problems, global warming problems, or primary mm -hmm. in view. But at the same time, he wore button. China is our number one enemy. Yeah. Well, if you, if you really want to work together, you don't tell the person you want to work with. You're my enemy. I mean, yeah, it, sure. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. No. And so I, I, I felt that in pure common sense, I mean, I wasn't telling anybody anything, but I did write a letter to Biden and she, and it seemed like they weren't paying attention to it. And that gave me a little bit of hope that maybe, maybe some kind of group could think together about this particular relationship. Mm -hmm. And none of our process organizations were set up to focus on the immediate contemporary issues of this kind. So I made one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and we haven't really done it either. But um, mm -hmm. but we do consider that 
we're, we're trying to work to persuade the countries of the world to cooperate and work together rather than to compete and yeah. try to destroy each other. And the number one, the most important cooperation is between the US and China. Mm -hmm. Because they're the two biggest polluters, they're the two greatest powers, they have the two greatest resources. Leave, if you leave out the US and China, I don't see any hope. Mm -hmm. I won't say that. I refuse to say that. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll still try to be hopeful. Yeah. But in my rational need to see some road between here and where we want to go, yeah, it's very hard. And I'm afraid things have just gotten worse. Uh, it looks like to me, people give me reassurances, but I'm having a hard time with it. Uh, Biden says first. The reality is that China has no intention of invading Taiwan. I mean, they may someday, but their fantasy is that Taiwan, once the, the Chiang Kai-shek crowd is no longer around, the mm -hmm. Taiwanese people will recognize that they want to be together with their kinfolk on the mainland and so forth. That, that's their fantasy. They don't ever talk about when we conquer Taiwan. Mm -hmm. It's when we reunite with Taiwan. Right. So the the idea that uh, in in Beijing they are thinking about invading Taiwan is pure fantasy. Hmm. When I started seeing literature in the New York Times and places like that that was speculating about the possibility that they might be thinking of that. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so that's the strategy to bring China down. Got it. We, we get the Taiwanese afraid, then they will turn to us for protection. Mm -hmm. And then Biden has assured them that we will come to your aid and defend you militarily. It won't be like Ukraine. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where the, where the situation stands. Yeah. To me, it's quite disturbing because China, of course, says uh, they, they are not trying to push anything now. But if the U.S. establishes special relations with Taiwan of a military kind, they will not tolerate it. And unfortunately, the only war the U.S. can win is a nuclear war. So I don't know. It just looks very frightening to me. Yeah, it, it does indeed. I'm wondering, is there um, are there ways that people can get involved with the Living Earth Movement or, or you know, at least donate or anything like that? Sure. Living Earth Movement, all one, without any spaces, mm -hmm. dot eco. Okay. And Excellent. They, they, and we're very happy to hear from them. We're very happy to hear their ideas. And we do have some projects going on that people can actually get involved with. Excellent. I, I'm not saying we really know how to do very much about changing. Sure. What I'm personally very eager to do, and, and it grows right out of what we've been doing, but we're not really set up very well to do much. So I'm not making any <laughs> but, but if we could, I think that there are um, thousands of organizations in the United States mm -hmm. that in one way or another are contributing toward a living earth. Yeah. And some of them are doing it by, with justice concerns, and some of them are doing it with peace concerns, and some of mm -hmm. them are doing it with environmental concerns, you know, yeah. all those differences. If if they really understood that they all were contributing to one goal and, yeah. and developed a sense of that. And that can happen kind of quickly. It can, I don't know how to make, but I'm, I am especially eager for anybody who knows how to make, yeah. <laughs> to make it happen. Sure, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping we can at least get a, get a thousand organizations to agree mm -hmm. that 
that they would like it to be known, that they, are, that they would like to see much higher priority given to the health of the planet, the health of the earth, than is now being given. And, Absolutely. And if, if we just published an ad, and I'm fantasizing, you understand, this is not something I'm, but yeah. this is what's on my mind to do. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we could get a thousand organizations to tell the government, you are not giving the priority to this that you should be. Mm -hmm. And that, that can be said to all governments. I mean, yeah. but if they're, and then if they then pay attention to what the government does, then we had a, we had a, a movement for sustainable society for a few years around 69, 70, 71, 72. Mm -hmm. And then, then we were told, oh, okay, that's all very well and good, but you should be specific and work on some particular problem. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we paid attention. And the people who told us to do that knew what they were doing, and we didn't know what we were doing. Mm. And it fragmented us. And since then, there's been no good legislation. Yeah. But now around global warming, I think that may, may be possible. To... I think so, too, you know, and I, I really admire your vision for that. I admire your aspirations. And I, I really hope that you're right about, um, you know, a th I, I think it's realistic to imagine that um, a number of organizations would work together to to all um, you know, appreciate and support each other. Exactly. And, yeah. and then jointly call the attention of a, somebody running for Congress. Well, well, what are you doing about the state of the, the health of the planet? Mm -hmm. The question isn't asked very often in political mm -hmm. campaigns now. It's really not. And it's kind of baffling because it seems like that would be the most well, practical it, thing for everybody to be thinking about that's not practical i don't know i don't know what exactly yeah exactly well you know i uh i have two more questions planned for you and they are kind of shifting gears a little bit but that's okay um something that we i mean we we've talked about whitehead a little bit and one of the ideas from whitehead that really intrigues me is the idea of God as lure. Yes. And um, I'm wondering, you know, in your own life and in your own thinking about that concept, you know, how, how, how do you experience that lure? Yes. Well, I think that everybody experiences it. Of course, some, it's possible to experience something, but then put the emphasis on something else that is inconsistent with it. Sure. Um, I, I, I tried simply phenomenologically to point out that the, the sense that there's more than one possible mode of act, action in almost all the time, yes. that's, I, I think people just know that, they feel it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any sense of responsibility. True. And of course, there are people who have very little sense of responsibility. <laughs> yeah. But what has appalled me about the secular mindset that governs the university is that it doesn't teach that. It didn't, you see, if you avoid saying there are any purposes that make any difference. Mm -hmm. And I think so. I'm, I'm very disappointed that the university has simply adopted a reductionistic, scientific, but not, sci not scientific in the sense of something that takes account of all the phenomena. Yeah. Okay, so in, in any case, I think that everybody has some sense that, that what they do is not the only thing, that it was not determined before they did it. There's an element of, of decision, choice, Freedom. Oh, no, freedom. That, that, mm -hmm. that is in the, not, not determined by the past. Now, yeah. now the reason that uh, so many philosophers today don't want to say that kind of thing is 
because it points immediately to some kind of spiritual reality. Mm. And it, you, it can't be, you see, it means that in addition to the past, mm -hmm. there is, there, there's, there's a world of potenti potentiality in addition to the world of actuality. Yeah. And it was, then I found much later that Heidegger had, had called and did the phenomenology and came through the language so similar to mine, their roof knocked for literally translated, call forward. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it, I, I'm quite, sh I, I'm quite confident about the phenomenology. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's there beautiful. Is, there is such a call. Now Heidegger, of course, in order to maintain, I mean, probably very sincerely, I, 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 when I started to say, in order to maintain status, <laughs> you know, in the modern intellectual world, to say, oh, I, I now know where everybody's experiencing God, which sort of end, the, end your role in the university. So Heidegger, as an atheist, he finally said, well, we're calling ourselves. Mm -hmm. that I don't think this the, fits the finet, phenomenological experience. Yeah. So in any case, if you don't want to bring God in, but, Okay, mm -hmm. but I do think that that you it's just one of the many things. Purpose is so important in the world, and to deny it, to, you you understand. In the origins of modern science, it was important to shift attention from final causes to efficient causes. Mm -hmm. That meant for purpose to push some kind. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, modern science was founded on that shift and it has its place. But to go from the fact that it has been brilliantly successful in a whole range of technological and scientific work to the idea that that's the, the final truth about human experience or about even the way animals experience the world. Mm -hmm. It's that leap that has, it's destroying us all, and it's completely rationally unnecessary. Science mm -hmm. can only deal with what is repetitive. Right. That's all it's designed to do, and to, to assume that there's nothing in the world that is not repetitive, it's just it's a radical conflict with the facts. We yeah. So history is disappearing. Wow. Yeah, I, I like your emphasis on, um, you know, just the, the phenomenological fact that we all feel that we do have that freedom to have novelty and to choose from different possible um, actions. And um, I, I, I also think about that a lot. And, and it seems like in process philosophy, it's the sense that, you know, the, the, the past is fixed, but the future is not. And we need to embrace the, the spaciousness within us, you know, to, to, um, to take advantage of, of choosing different ways of being instead of just repeating. And uh, uh, I, I think that what you can say, well, we all know that, so it doesn't matter that, that we can't teach it. It does matter that we can't teach it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really troubles me that we devote trillions of dollars to teaching our children to the, that their purposes make no difference. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so... My last question here, basically, um, you know, kind of the two main flavors of Christianity that interest me the most, you know, I, I actually grew up uh, a Methodist as well. Oh. Um, so I, I grew up going to Method a Methodist church every Sunday, and um, my parents are, are still very, um, you know, committed Methodist. Uh, there was a point in my life where I started to kind of transition out of Christianity and, and um, 
you know, kind of got into Buddhism and kind of went through a, a agnostic phase. I, you know, I've, I've been through a lot of different transformations when it comes to spirituality. But um, in the last several years, you know, I, I kind of have, I, I don't consider myself a Christian, but I still have a lot of um, respect and, and deep resonance with, with, you know, certain Christian principles and teachings and stuff like that. Um, but I would say that the two main kind of flavors of Christianity that interest me the most are, um, you know, kind of, I know you've mentioned like the social gospel, you know, so the, the social the social gospel yeah so like that that iteration of christianity is is you know something that that i connect with um and and the other stream is kind of like mystical christianity you know christian mysticism and i know uh, you know i've uh, your your approach to um, your own philosophy and theology is, I would say, is very aligned with with kind of social gospel um, approach. Uh, but I'm I'm curious, you know, I'm curious about how you feel about mysticism. Are you interested in mysticism? Do you have you know have you spent time reading any of the Christian mystics, you know, even like Meister Eckhart and stuff like that, and um, before you answer that, I just wanted to, to read this quote from Meister Eckhart that always stuck with me. Um, to me, it kind of captures Christian mysticism to me. He says, uh, the eye with which I see God is the same with which God sees me. My eye and God's eye is one eye and one sight and one knowledge and one love. So do you have any thoughts about that quote and, and mysticism? Well, mysticism can mean a lot of things. Sure. And um, one of the, of the things it tends to mean is the priority of sight over hearing. Mm. And the Bible gives priority to hearing over sight. And the, the problem with giving priority to sight is that it tends to blind you to history. Mm. Now, I, I think that there is a kind of mysticism that doesn't do that, but it's much rarer. I was I'm very interested as a young man, I was fascinated and delighted with all the sexless perennial philosophy. Mm -hmm. And then I became completely disappointed to realize he never quotes from a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. His perennial philosophy is Hindu. Yeah. And um, since I think Buddha was right in his debate, mysticism sounds like it might be independent of theology. Mm -hmm. But I think it tends to to go with a a philosophy of of substance and of sight. Interesting. So I think that Christian mysticism, uh, a bit, when I say Christian, I mean biblical following Jesus. Mm -hmm. The big issue is to hear God's voice. And again, I, obviously I don't mean literally. Mm -hmm. I think that our fundamental relationship to God is one of being called. Yeah. And to be, be responsive to the divine call is the most important thing. Now, the divine call may in, in, in John the Baptist's case, in Jesus' case, in Paul's case, he called to go out alone into the wilderness. Yeah. Now, yeah. now you may say in, alone in the wilderness, that sounds a bit mystical. <laughs> right. But I think the issue in every case was to try to understand as well as possible. 
what they call to do. Right. Yeah. Go the retreat and the return because it's like they didn't stay out there and Buddha didn't stay out there either. No. So uh, I, I think that there are many, kind, many kinds of, of mystical activity. Yeah. Even, even the ones that I'm saying don't, don't really fit well with, with biblical thinking. Mm -hmm. that, that can be very beneficial. But the, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about making mysticism kind of the supreme goal right the mystical experiences mm -hmm. what it's all about mm -hmm. yeah i agree with that yeah well you know as a last note just connected to that i you know i i actually listened to a debate that you did with i, I can't remember the man's name now but it was basically classical theism uh it was it was a bait a debate where you were you know kind of talking about process theology versus classical theology, I guess. And um, one thing that you said in that debate about kind of like um, a, a sense that we have that is almost, it's hard to explain. You, you were saying that there's something that precedes the five senses for us or, oh, yeah. you know, and so, um, you know, maybe we can end with that. But to me, something that almost seems mystical, yeah. right? So um, I, I yeah. think you can make you can use the word mystical for the things that I strongly approve of. Sure, sure. But I would start somewhere else rather than by studying what has in the past been called mystical. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. No, no. For Whitehead, uh, the five senses are by no means the most important part of it. Of in my experience in the moment, I'm being much more shaped by the past. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, the past includes seeing and, you know, all the senses, but, the, but the, the relation of the present occasion is not mediated through the eyes when it remembers some, even something it had seen in the past. Right. So, for why they calls it feeling in the mode of causal efficacy mm -hmm. is the past is flowing into the present in every moment. And that precedes seeing and touching and smelling and so forth. True. And, and, and it's, it, it really, it's what gives you unity as a human being. Mm hmm in other words, you are not constituted in your unique personality by what you're smelling and touching right at this moment. True. So that to the, the, the view of the British empiricists that wow. our only relationship to the world is through the senses, just mm -hmm. sends us in the wrong direction. Yeah. And then Hume said he couldn't even find causality. And Kant accepted that. And it, uh, we feel causality all the time. We just yeah. can't find it in sight. Mm -hmm. so, I, the, the mistakes made in the history of philosophy are so drastic. <laughs> yeah, well, thank goodness we had uh, Whitehead and others to, you know, disassemble or try to confront some of those if, issues if they could be allowed into the university it would help yep that's right well john thank you so much for talking with me today i've really enjoyed it and uh i feel honored that that you took me up on the conversation oh i'm very pleased and, uh, absolutely and i'm i'm very happy about the the living earth movement that you started and uh you know, I'm, I'm going to try to stay updated on everything you're doing with that. Well, wish us luck. We don't know what we're doing yet. We need mm -hmm. help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to send people in that direction. I'm okay. going to, uh, you know, I'm going to do, do what I can to, to stay plugged yeah. into it as well. As long as you, un that they understand they're joining us in trying to figure out how yes. we can heal the planet. Yes, and not exactly. that we know how to do it. Yep.
they will just do what we say. Everything collaboration. Will I wish we could do that, but <laughs> thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you have a great day, John. Same to you. All right. Take care.